Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 256. That's 256 with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How are you guys feeling? How are you guys doing? Great. Amazing. How am I? All right. Get in there. Little by little. What can you do? Every day is a new day. Monday is the start of a new week. We're getting it going. We're popping. We're striving. All lights are green. Even if it's red, you cross the road, you die. Who cares? You go to heaven. But anyway, <laughs> thanks so much for tuning in via YouTube. If you are, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcasting apps, of course, leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show and you want to get the show in full audio format before anyone else does on YouTube, two or three days before, make sure you sign up to the Patreon down below, patreon.com forward slash Agostino, patreon.com forward slash, not slash, but forward slash Agostino, that's A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O, patreon.com forward slash A-G-O-S-T-I-N-H-O, for as little as one dollar a month, you can get full access to my entire audio archive of shows via patreon.com forward slash Agostino. Thank you for tuning in. Big show plan for you today. Loads of stuff to get through. Not going to waste any more time blabbering about my weekend because nothing happened. I went to Pirate Studios, had a bit of a knees up. You know, the new Pirate Studios in Dawson is bueno. It's actually great. No, you know, famous last word. I'm not going to talk about weekend. Here's not talk about weekend. My weekend was pretty dull, right? But I went to Pirate Studios. Pirate Studios is flipping awesome, right? Because it's a great, amazing place where they have these little units with little studios where you can basically go and record some music, you can rehearse with your band, or if you want and you're a failed DJ like I am, you can go and, you know, play your terrible mix to your heart's desire on the big, loud PA system with the latest um, audio, with the latest DJing equipment they, they have available in the market at the moment. Absolutely beautiful place to go, especially for someone like myself who is more often than not usually playing in some dingy bar somewhere in the middle of nowhere town where the equipment's always a flip of a coin. Every bar and every club I've always played in, especially on the way up, especially on, on my ascendancy to finally playing in a place like Bergheim someday in the future. This is a goal I have on my bucket list and, you know, other places that I won't reveal just yet, but that's the kind of level I'm hoping to get to, right? Most of the places I play at in this infancy are just terrible. The mixers are covered in beer. Um, the people that work there have no idea how anything works anyway, so they can't help you. So usually when you go places, you think like someone can help you that works in the pub. There's usually the sound guy or whatever, but it's not. These guys and girls that work in bars already have enough to deal with. You know, they, they don't want to have to then become uh, an audio technician or something and help you out with your thing. They kind of just pull it there. If it turns on and the light goes green, their job is basically done. And if anything, most of the bar people that I go, or most of the bar people that I get speaking to, especially in the bars and pubs are bars and pubs that play at they're usually a bit put off by the DJs that play because they're usually the DJs that play in those kind of places are terrible right for the most part if you're playing in a place where no one really wants you to be there you're definitely not going to put your best foot forward for most people I don't do that, that thing I usually go at hard I usually play at bars and pubs like I was playing in Panorama Bar I take it more very seriously I kind of read the crowd I play um, room appropriate music at room appropriate levels I really do try my best to be as professional as I can in those environments because I feel as if I can if I can build good habits playing in places where no one cares that I'm there I'm also going to have those same good habits when i get to other bigger spots and places but usually a bar person will tell you more likely than not everyone that plays there is terrible so if anything if any if the equipment doesn't work it's actually a blessing for them they don't have to subject themselves listening to dubstep at 7 p.m in the, in the evening which does happen don't get me wrong they don't even don't think i'm joking there are bars and pubs where a dj will rock up there and just start playing a drum and bass set at 8 p.m when you're just having a beer with your friends trying to catch up. Do you know what I mean? It's like, this isn't a place. It's just in the time. Like, come on, read a room at least. But some people just don't do that. They just, can't, you know, I guess you spend all your week getting your tunes together and you finally get to play in front of a crowd. You're like, you know what? I'm taking this chance with both hands. I'm not going to let this go. I guess. I don't know. Don't ask me. I'm not that person. But, um, I do appreciate prior Studios for having that equipment available because it does really go a long way to kind of get me up to the level that I want to be at week in, week out. Because, you know, I've got a controller at home that I do some mixes on and I kind of practice some, um, some uh, you know, some maybe mixing techniques or try and see if different these two tunes work together but for the most part there is no substitute for playing on actual cdjs on an actual legit mixer with actual legit pa um 
or monitors come and feeding back the tunes that you're playing. It really gives you an appreciation of sound. It gives you an appreciation of mix. It gives you an appreciation of um, textures of the tunes that you're playing. Maybe even sometimes if you really want to get nerdy about it, even sometimes the tone of the stuff that you're playing, it really does give you a different sort of level of understanding of what it goes into actually crafting a good DJ set. And it really isn't about playing bangers. That's why sometimes I get a little bit agitated when I hear people, you know, gassing up their media lenses and the shot of the wits of this world because I don't know, anyone that's played regularly, you know, out because there was a time and period of my life where I was playing every Friday, every Saturday night in various places all over London and stuff. And you know that, you know, really DJing, you get really, you, you only get better at DJing the more you play. It's I guess it's like most things. Well, not most things. I guess if you try and learn guitar, you can get pretty good at home, just banging it out an hour a day, right? And then once you get on stage, everyone's like, whoa, blown away. But DJing, you can, you can, as much practice as you want to do at home, as you know, you could get, even I'd imagine even sometimes getting CDs at home doesn't really help. You really do need to have that real life experience of being in front of a crowd and having them respond or not respond to the mixes you're playing or the stuff that you're syncing up or getting getting ready to play in your crate you know kind of clearing the dance floor getting them back on board bloody blah 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 and you'd know that you get you get very proficient at djing very quickly and you then find out that there are cheat ways to kind of get better there's a way to kind of just go and play the the 30 tunes that you know always get a reaction in a coherent one one hour one hour 20 minute set and you're perfectly fine no one's going to say anything bad to you or you can go in there and really try your hardest not to do that and try and play a set that's a little bit more difficult a set that might require you to um kind of you know work the crowd make them come on your side it's a very very different skill to do so sometimes when you see these people like them immediate lenses getting gas up and stuff i'm like i get it right i get it because you know getting played to play on a bigger stage like that you kind of do maybe owe it yourself to just go out with the bangers but there is a whole different skill when it comes to crafting an actual set that can kind of guide people through a night especially the warm-up sets like, there's a real skill to that or even or even sometimes the, the sunday morning the sunday afternoon brunch sets right outdoors like i think burger are doing at the moment now they've opened up their garden people are playing you know to people that are just sitting down having a smoke you know taking in the atmosphere there's a whole different wave of playing that sort of music and playing like a big festival stage places so don't get me wrong they've all got their talents but i think there's different um skill sets needed for each place but for the most part i much prefer people that are well-rounded because i feel like if you can play a garden set or at 4 p.m somewhere in the middle of whatever town right for a crowd that doesn't mind having a dance but they're mostly there to chit chat and be seen you're definitely going to be able to take that same sound and apply it to a, a little dingy warehouse space somewhere because you know what fits different scenarios you have the crate that can accommodate people sitting you know on a canal boat somewhere people you know taking copious amount of ketamine in a toilet in the middle of berlin uh people drinking too much prosecco in the middle of soho you can play different sort of sets and i think that's the kind of um place i want to get to and no better no better way of doing that than going and you know spending a couple of hours in pirate studios putting your mixes together and recording i've got a couple of mixes actually coming up so definitely check that out i'm going to upload them on my youtube channel some videos that i have recorded of the weekend i'm chopping up into some little bits and pieces of promo that i can put up on my instagram page all that sort of good stuff just to keep myself creative nothing really um much more expensive of that and just again just to kind of um put it out there the stuff that i do because again I'm, I'm i'm a big i'm a i hate people that talk about stuff that they do and don't actually show it so yeah um let's show more doing and that's where i'm at, at the moment but anyway jump pack show for you to get jump pack show for you guys to get your teeth sunk into today loads of things to get through influences um kevin hart chris D'Elia, other bits and bobs to go through and so grab your favorite drink i've got myself a little glass of room temperature water and a couple of oddly sliced lemons in there but if you've got anything stronger get that if you've got something lighter get that too shop on shopping let's have a little bogey that's always nice here on the, on the on my microphone in it right that's always pleasurable not anyway so first things first man it seems like instagram no it seems like twitter or social media in general they're going crazy about all these influences in la throwing party after party after party after party during a global pandemic now i'm not that bothered i don't really care i think i mentioned it previously in my other videos that i really do understand people who are struggling to accept the reality that we're in at the moment and they're doing everything that they can to fight against it, everything that they can to kind of resist um succumbing 
to the impending doom that is to 2020 being completely over um the fascination or the idea that some people had that they were going to be able to save their summer has completely flown out the window i think some people have come to the grown-up adult decision of like you know the best way to save your summer is to actually stay alive this year so you can see next year too so you can have an actual great summer right um but i think people also need to come to the realization that unfortunately COVID-19 has just exposed or basically shone a light on the fact that people who have means, people who have the ability to travel or the ability to maybe sit at home on their asses for, you know, X amount of months or years will do so. And they're going to flaunt it in your face. If you thought they were going to just do it in quiet, uh, you know, in private and kind of keep it to themselves and not make you feel bad or, you know, try and set a good example you are greatly mistaken and again maybe it's a kind of um maybe it's a it's the fault of the public in general for anointing these people as influencers i'm talking about youtube influencers or the tiktok people because i don't really think you influencers is a good term for somebody like that like those charlie d'amelio people i don't think they're influencers really i don't know um when i think of influencers i think of people that have a pacific set no, have a pacific like um have a pacific thing that they influence for whether it's fashion photography and that's about it you don't actually care about what they do day to day or they don't actually want to show you what they do day to day um i think what these charlie d'amelios and these kind of people do especially when they're that young is that you know it's not her fault that she kind of took off on tiktok and she became one of the most followed people on there i think for the most part that's not her fault um and she hasn't necessarily tried to become a brand she's just a girl that dances in her bedroom with her friends Maybe she gets involved in some boy drama like every other teenager gets involved in. But that's about it. I don't think it's fair to accept her to now. To, it's not fair for her to be expected to be a role model. That's what I'm saying, because I don't think she came into it trying to do that. I think it's completely different when you try and be like one of these, um, you know, um, avocado on toast and manicured nails, Monday morning motivational kind of influence of people on Instagram. That's a completely different lane because you're obviously trying to create an entire world that people can sort of be immersed by. You're selling planners, you're selling, you know, stationery, you're doing plant workshops and business thingy. You know, you're really trying to get people involved in your, it's a whole 360 thing. But I think with the Charlie Demillers and these kind of people, the Jake Pauls, the Tanner Mongos, like it's all about what they're presenting online and that's it everything else happens outside of it it's just whatever you're reading into it but i don't think they're really going out of their way to be um good inf good influences or role models in any kind of way so it's kind of funny and surprising to see people get so hot and bothered that they would be not disregarding completely all the kind of guidelines set in place by the very states that they're living about staying at home and not gathering in big crowds and throwing big parties because it is what it is isn't it they're young they're rich they've come into money pretty early in life and especially for people that i think it's different especially when you're somebody i'd imagine when you're that young and you have you already have parents that are supporting you or no you, you already come from a back you already have a background where you're kind of wealthy anyway and then you get a bit of extra money on your own especially for a kid who kind of felt because i'd imagine if you're a rich kid nowadays it's pretty hard unless you're like a complete narcissist to be happy that you're having to live on your mom's or dad dime right you kind of want to make the impression that you're kind of hustling on your own and that these t-shirts are playing for your are paying for your g-wagon when everyone knows you know selling 30 dollar t-shirts isn't going to necessarily pay for you to have a house on the hollywood hills and a g-wagon do you know what I mean it maybe can do in a certain extent but for the most part we know that you've definitely got a trust fund in the background so maybe some of these kids they're probably so made up that they've finally been able to make something of themselves right especially at, you know if their family has maybe disowned them or maybe thinks that, you know, all they're doing is, you know, bleeding them dry, that I'm not surprised that they're kind of acting out in this weird way where they're kind of trying to reject what's going on in the outside world, which is mad, really, because it seems like they don't, like, it's not even like they're hiding. They absolutely upload all these videos online. They don't really try and, you know, pretend it's not happening. They're, they're doing them in plain sight, right? Recording their videos, uploading them, their parties are happening, and they're just not giving an absolute toss. And I think people just need to, except that you know they, they're they not really influencers they're, they're sort of like online celebrities in a way that's what they are influencer isn't really the right term to really describe them or just maybe describe them as a public figure like you would do on instagram but this is an account called deaf noodle that's essentially been documenting all of the parties happening with all these teenagers in the hollywood hills and it's been pretty interesting um so first of all you've got this video here from charlie d'amelio 
um, no, Demi Dixie D'Amelio, the, the sister, I'm, I'm assuming, talking about um, comments on Bryce Hall's party saying that everyone needs to be more thoughtful about it. And this is obviously funny because she obviously had a party herself. And it seems like they're doing that thing where they all have parties. No, before they have a party, they all have a party. They all get tested. So they're negative. So then when they go to a party, they can just say, yeah, we're all negative. So we can go out and have a good time. And then when they finish it, they get tested again to make sure they're not, they're not positive and they just continue. So they just keep getting tested. It's really yeah. honestly bizarre. It's sort of like, essentially sort of like sleeping around raw, but every time you do so, you get someone to have a test at home with you. That isn't really the point. You should just try and practice safe sex so that, you know, just in case you are carrying something that you have no idea you're carrying and spreading it around. But, oh man, these people are absolute legends. But seeing these paparazzi people hand them on the streets is even more that? funny. A lot of influencers are getting flagged for attending this uh, birthday parties. Um, what do you think about that? I don't know. I th I just think everyone needs to be more thoughtful about other people. Yeah. Some even if it doesn't affect you, it affects other people. All right, that's cool. We're I love these non. I love that teenagers have these ability to have these like non statements. And not these like generic sayings that just don't mean anything. Like be more thoughtful and da -da -da -da. what? Que -que -que -pasa? But again, what do you expect accosting a teenager in the middle of the street? Right, the morning after they've just been, you know, spending, you know, the morning after they've drank what a hundred fucking little tins of white claw. What do you expect them to say? And I think this video, baby, ba basically encapsulates everything that's happening and probably puts it into a better light because, um, yeah, they're just kids, man. They're just kids who are living their life, having fun. As a uh, uh, Jordan, what Jordan Dunn would say, what's what's her name? What's that girl's name with Kylie and Jenna and stuff? Whatever that girl's name was, having fun, LA, doing having a good time. This is what they're basically doing, and this is a good example of it. So this is TikToker's Cynthia Parker, who has 2.5 million followers, says about Bryce Hall's party. Let's play this one. What do you What do you guys think about Bryce's party? Because a lot of people were saying that he might have like had too many people over. I mean, no comments. It's twenty first. I mean, I'm not saying I agree with it, but it's his twenty first, dude. That is you true. Know? Okay. okay. <laughs> Rich kids are the best, man. They just, I love that they just operate on an entire different galaxy, isn't it? This is 21st, isn't it? What do you expect? It's like, it's as if no one else, it's, a, it's as if like whatever's happening on the outside world isn't actually happening. It's just insane. I would love to be that oblivious. I would love to have, but again, I'm not sure if it's wealth. Maybe it's wealth. Maybe that is what wealth is about, right? They always say time is money. And when you have money, you have a lot of time, right? Like, because you just have more free time especially if you have investments or you have businesses that are making money for you while you sleep you're not having to burn the midnight oil to keep the roof over your head so you have more free time to do the things that you love it's sort of like the mantra of the four-hour work week right the idea is that you can make a business a muse that can make you a recurring amount of money so you can spend the time that you do have available doing the things you actually do enjoy hence the four-hour work week inflammatory title but that's the premise of it and maybe that's the point of wealth wealth is this Maybe that's maybe that's conventional form of wealth. So where you can be so oblivious, so unplugged from the world, where you can genuinely, you know, it, it's generally maybe that's a real representation of wealth. Being able to say like, you know, what, I don't watch the news, I don't keep up with current affairs, because you, because you, you don't need to, you don't need to keep up with current affairs if you have money. You can legitimately fly away somewhere to the middle of Bali, maybe not Bali, Southeast Asia, maybe somewhere else. Um, in it in 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 maybe northern America, maybe some you can rent an amazing Airbnb Airbnb somewhere, uh, in the middle of the country. Maybe go somewhere in Europe where the fig where the kind of COVID cases aren't that high, you know, somewhere in, maybe in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, get somewhere really ridiculously cheap for you know get a lot of spaces for your money, and just coast, just enjoy life, get everything ordered to you, delivered. Um, and I'm sure even in these hectic times, there are people, fixers around who are helping rich people navigate um, the COVID waters and hook them up with certain things that are maybe not available to the general public. Maybe that is what wealth is all about. Being young, attractive, and just oblivious. Just just oblivious. What? It's my 21st. Of course I'm going to throw a birthday party. What's wrong with you? You know what I mean? I mean, I really can't speak on the Bryce. situation I okay. because yeah. I had a 10 million party planned for me. Okay. Which I know was a wrong decision, but, you know, okay. I didn't go just because, you know, I was being safe or whatever. There you go. Were you guys at Bryce Hall? One person has a bedazzled mask on that I'm not sure what effectiveness it has. Another person has a mask on their chin. It's just, they're just perfect, aren't they? They're just perfect human beings. Oh, party the other no, night. No, no. No, but your boyfriend was. was. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, okay, everybody wants to know. There was so there was a fist fight and a gun was pulled out. That's, what? that's Sydney what, was in Canada. I was in Canada. Were, I was in my little like my little home in Canada. Okay, so you were being good. Yeah. Supposedly there's a rumor that Bryce like started a fist fight and a big brawl broke broke out and there was like a rapper that Man, imagine being the Hollywood fix guy having to talk to these teenagers about this these incidents. Like it's just paparazzi life is just a madness, isn't it? But I don't know, man. I don't know. What about you guys? You think people should give these guys a break or just let off them? I, I just don't understand why everyone's bothered about this really. They're gonna keep partying, they're gonna have a good time. The parties look a bit dead anyway to me, to be completely honest. Um, if ever there was a party that I didn't want to go to, it would be a party that has copious amounts of teenagers that dance in front of camera. Dance as well. TikTok dancing isn't dancing. Yeah, let's just get that one thing right. I don't know what it is, but it's not dancing. Whatever they're doing on TikTok, having those people in one place, having a good time, isn't necessarily my idea of a party. They just, it looks, I don't know, but maybe this is the American way that they party. You know? <laughs> TikTok and a video. I guess I, I just I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's part of it. Isn't it? The, it's the personality that sells, and there's another one as well. Twenty one right now, baby. Ah! Have you ever been this excited for your own birthday? I've never been this excited. Again, this always makes me laugh. I've never really given. Maybe this is the issue. I've never really given that much of a shit about my own birthday ever. Maybe the last birthday I actually gave a crap about was maybe I was at eighteen. No, twenty one. Maybe twenty one, twenty two. That might have been the last one where I actually legitimately had, you know, a good time and went to go out with a bang and I was counting down my birthday. But after a certain age, birthdays just become like, I don't know. Who cares, isn't it? Like, especially the ones, especially the people that try and make it. No, especially the people that basically impose their birthday on you. Like, it's my birthday. You must stop everything you're doing to come to my special day. That's when it gets a bit, you know. Cause I think if you if you want to go and celebrate your birthday for a week on your own and go on a bender, right, a little hangover style bender, then fair play. But when you have to accost everybody and make them feel guilty for not attending your seven day birthday marathon across the country, that's when it gets a little bit ridiculous. But again, it, just in general, I've never been excited for my own birthday. Let alone get people excited for mine, right? That's that's the mad thing about it, because people are re really amped up. I guess because, like I said, these people aren't influencers; they're celebrities. They are famous people that use this app. I don't think they're influencers. Influencers is a weird term to kind of describe people because there's nothing... I don't know. Do, do the kids want to look like these guys? I don't know if they do. Um, Are they curious about their... Like, I'd imagine a lot of them are pretty well-off from well-off families anyway. There's nothing to really aspire to from being a rich kid that dances on TikTok. I'd imagine so. Um, It's not as inspirational as like, you know, the Nasty Girl sort of story, right? That That's what I think of a conventional influencer, the girl that made Nasty Girl. Right, you start off from nothing. You sell stuff on eBay. Um, you're this like you know dirty hipster girl that everyone kind of identifies with. That's sort of trying to make it in the fashion industry. It's hard. You're stumbling into roadblocks. You're a female. You have all that sort of like battles going on with the industry and the power dynamics. And blah blah blah. You document your story all online. People gather and band around you. They want to support your brand. And boom, you blow up. You get investment. And you become this mega global brand. And blah, blah, blah. you start doing all these speeches and talks all over the place. That's why I think of a conventional influencer. Right? There's a an entire 360 world that they're kind of encompassing you know you see you see a journey from eating meat to going vegan to being with a long-term boyfriend breaking up marrying some other dude getting pregnant yeah i mean that you see that whole entire arc but you're curious about everything but i don't know are you really that bothered about what dixie d'amelio gets up to in the morning what she eats for breakfast if she's pointing at you and doing those flipping dances and stuff does that really matter so why are you even surprised if she was gonna throw a party for herself like i don't know I just find it all weird, man. I don't know. I find it very, very bizarre. The parties don't even look that fun, in my opinion, again. Maybe. But it's a very different way of partying in America, isn't it? Especially American kids. They have a very different way of doing it. It's not your conventional... Uh, I don't know. It just looks interesting. It's all like a show thing. Like It's like, you remember when you were in school and you went to like a school disco and all the girls were standing on one side, the boys standing on the other? And then you get older and you go to like a sixth form school party in a similar sort of vibe. But some people, you know, some of the, the freaks are dancing and grinding on each other. But most people are just like mingling and just hang, hanging out trying to show off the outfits. That's what it sort of reminds me of. Everyone just standing around looking at each other. <laughs> and probably mad amounts of MDMA. I can just imagine that whole room is just vibrating. People are just like bouncing off the walls. 
Does look like a vibe to me. I don't know why you guys are surprised by these people. Look, man, he's getting into a bloody thriller van. He's getting into a van sponsored. Thriller are sponsoring these kids to go out and party and get fucked up. Like, what do you expect to happen, man? Like, come on. Come on, guys. But hey, what do I know? Let's move on, man. Who cares about influencers running around and muck doing that nonsense? So, um, next on the list, what else do I want to talk about with this video? Oh, yeah. Um, so I saw this interesting article on page six regarding LNG Generous hanging out with Kevin Hart. So I'm assuming most of you are aware of the things going on around Ellen Generous, where she's basically been accused of cultivating a toxic work environment. Employees, former guests are all going around and basically saying that she's a bit of a nightmare to deal with, a nightmare to work with. And the people that she's hired to basically man the, the ship and sort of, uh, yeah, man the ship, executive producers and stuff are also pretty horrible people as well. And, you know, some sexual harassment things are coming out, the woodwork and all that sort of good stuff. But I guess it's important to note because I guess for some reason, I don't know why, but I never really got this impression. But I guess some people had this idea in their head that because she has this be kind mantra that she was somehow a nice person uh, or an easy to get along with person. But I never really got that impression. I always thought she was a little bit highly strung, which is not an issue. I don't think you should be cancelled for being mean. That's really bizarre um, that we've gotten in, we've gotten to a stage in life now where, you know, again, cancel culture has its faults, but it also has its positives, right? Where if you can't get somebody, if you can't essentially take somebody down via a police report, if they did something bad to you or you can't get them arrested or fined, whatever it may be, the least you can do is ruin them online, reputational wise, right? Um, let them take a bit of a hit for the pain that they made you suffer you know years back or whenever it happened right that's the most you can do but obviously it gets it can go a bit too far when people start making up stories or you get trialed by me or you get trialed or you get uh judged by social media without having the ability to defend yourself blah 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 but i also don't like this idea that somehow the entertainment industry these kids or these people in general who are working in this infrastructure somehow think they have a right to work in an environment that breeds positivity or that has um characters in there that always look after your best interest and you know are trying to make sure that you progress and get where you need to get to and giving you chances it's never ever been like that i, I don't know what anyone else thinks but having worked in you know parts of some sort of subculture or a scene that has limited amount of opportunities it's always the same right the the very top people get all the chances and the people at the bottom have to scrap for whatever else is available right I literally fight for the scraps but for the most part you do grow up very quickly in these environments because you encounter so many different types of personalities along your way that you're somehow able to kind of figure out how to deal with them and you also are able to know what you want to be like the kind of person that you want to be when, when you get to a place that you need to get to but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to disparage the person that you worked with previously right but if you worked for Ellen DeGeneres and she was an absolute b-i-c-t-h to you you would know more likely than not the next job you got especially if you got a job with some level of seniority that you're going to go above and beyond not to be like her or not to copy the things that she laid bare but the, the, the fact that she gave you a chance was enough already and in it like you didn't really expect that <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just naive that you'd go into it thinking that the person you saw on TV was the same person that you're going to see behind the cameras. And I also sometimes think there is a lot that people don't understand that you have to deal with when you're Ellen DeGeneres and you're the face of an entire network or an entire show. The amount of money that's in attached to her as well in Hollywood, people don't really understand, which is we, you, you're kind of getting a bit of a glimpse with it. When it, hap when it comes to the whole Megan Thee Stallion, Tory Lanez shooting incident. We have no real details have come out about this story. You just have Megan's side of it, which sounds a little bit hard to believe, but let's say it is true and she did get shot in both feet and nothing happened to her bones and she isn't crippled or anything happened. She just you know, have happened to have the luck of the Irish and it passed through complete flesh. Um, but, you know, there's so many parts of the story that doesn't really add up. Um, we haven't involved Kylie Jenner in it. Tori Lenz hasn't made any comment on it. But you soon realize that, you know, there's a lot of money involved in these personalities, right? A lot of brands um, have staked uh, their entire, you know, futures on the success of these people within their own areas of expertise. So they're doing whatever they can behind the scenes to quell the story, to spin a certain narrative so that their investment doesn't just go down the drain. 
that's what it's about money right money is what moves things forward and what keeps that whole place ticking so if you're an degenerate the amount of pressure that's on you to keep that train to keep that whole infrastructure going chugging along especially during these difficult times is very very hard it's not easy thing to do and i'd imagine day to day you're not going to be the most pleasant person to be around or in general even just the fact that you've got that kind of level of power and that kind of level of influence in the industry it's going to maybe give you a different i don't know anyone i'll just imagine i think the same thing with presidents and prime ministers anyone that would gladly try and become a prominent political figure in any way shape or form you've probably got something you're probably a little bit fucked up right you probably uh sh you're probably uh made of different stuff than you and i right to be able to willingly put yourself through that rigmarole just so you can be a prime minister an mp uh, a member of parliament a governor whatever it doesn't it's not not every not your everyday average citizen will want to do that job so i think if you're any generous you have to the public needs to be aware that she probably isn't you know she's not the same as you and i and again she's a stand-up comic right for what 20 plus years so there's already a lot of you know turmoil and trouble there that goes on but regardless this article from page six it's pictures Ellen Jones with Kevin Hart and made toxic workplace claims. And I don't know. I kind of rate Kevin Hart, man. I gave him a lot of credit because, again, like I said before, I think Hollywood has proved with the whole Chris D'Elia situation and, you know, the TFAT K guys, the Brian Callen and Brendan Shaw, how they threw him under the bus and stuff. It kind of laid to bear how um, surface level the friendships are in Hollywood and how people can sometimes, you know, ditch you completely, especially if you have an allegation hanging over your head and they want to protect their sponsors. So for Kevin Hart to go out of his way to kind of get pictured having dinner, with Anne DeGeneres on an, you know, an outside porch area somewhere where they're definitely going to get papped. Don't, don't think this is a, a press opportunity. It's really commendable because, you know, he has his own things that he has to deal with, Kevin Hart and his own side of the business. And I'm sure being associated or aligned with Ellen isn't going to help, but he's definitely really putting down a flag in the ground and saying, hey, this is my friend and I'm going to stand by her because what I know of her, she's a good person. And you can't, you know, again, it's a bit of, it's a bit empty because I think if you work with her, you probably know her more than what Kevin Hart does. Kev, you know, Ellen DeGeneres sees Kevin Hart as an equal. But I guess if you're an employee, you've definitely seen the, the dragon in Ellen DeGeneres. But I just do think it's commendable that he would go out of his way to stick his neck out to kind of defend his friend in public this way. From page six, it says the following. Ellen DeGeneres was spotted on Saturday with her pal Kevin Hart shortly after the Jumanji actor defended the in Battle Star amid allegations of toxicity at the Ellen DeGeneres show. Dressed in a printed navy top, beige cargo pants and sandals, DeGeneres 62 lunch with Hart 41 at the Rosewood Miriam Beach in Montecito, California, where she was sipping white wine while chatting with Hart, who wore a light blue shirt and matching shorts. Earlier this month, Hart joined choruses of celebrities including Katy Perry, Scooter Braun, and Diane Keating, among others, voicing support for DeGeneres, who has recently come under fire over claims that she's created a toxic work environment and former Ellen Jenner staffers have accused top executive of a show of sexual misconduct. Now, that's just looking at it from plainly, right? It's a bit, I would imagine if you're, so, it's, it's interesting, I guess because cancel culture is getting a bit crazy and certain people are getting thrown under the bus that shouldn't get thrown under the bus. Some celebrities are being, are getting worried that if they don't stick up for somebody, eventually cancel culture is going to come after them. But I still think it's a bit strange that celebrities are coming out and defending somebody who's being accused of creating a toxic work environment by her employees. That's very strange and pretty tone definite. It's not that, you know, another celebrity is accusing Ellen of like blocking her chances of becoming a Hollywood star. No, employees that work with her day to day showrunners and stuff are saying that she's a horrible person to work for. Right. And that she doesn't create the best working environment and her mantra of be kind is complete falsehood that's only reserved for the show and then celebrities are coming and saying no 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 she's nice she's really lovely to me of course she is you're in bloody jumanji of course she's going to be nice to you do you know what i mean like so I, I don't know that that is that really doesn't sit right with me but i also do think it's an effect it's a natural effect or consequence of some celebrities getting cancelled who shouldn't get cancelled and these celebrities feeling as if eventually the cancellation guillotine is going to come down on their neck and they'd much rather stick their neck out and try and defend somebody so that when it does happen to them they have somebody that can rally around them i think so i think that's basically because it doesn't really it's odd timing that these guys will come out now and defend ellen in, in this case because it doesn't really seem that it seems quite cut and dry she obviously is a bit of a pain to work for um, I don't think it's any secret. I think everyone probably knew this, and but I guess you know in this new age where everyone wants to have a safe space, it gets a bit of a problem. But I don't know. But again, I still rate Kevin Hart for doing it. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a, again it's him kind of paying her back for sticking by him when he was going through his troubles. Um, it continues here. It says it's crazy to see my friend go through 
um, what she's going through publicly. Hot post on Instagram early in August. He said, I have known Ellen for years and I can honestly say that she's one of the dopest people on this effing planet. She has treated my family and my team with love and respect from day one. The internet has become a crazy world of negativity. We are falling in love with people's downfall. It's honestly sad. When did we get here? Yeah, there is an element of that. I do think there's some people that were looking forward to Ellen failing. I think much like James Corden in the UK, Ellen has a, a group of people that love her and a group of people that completely hate her guts, which is understandable. I guess if you're on that level, there's just what it comes with the it comes with the territory there's probably no rational reason why people don't like her she might be a little bit dry on the show the whole dancing thing is a bit cringe but she seems pretty decent enough celebrities seem to like sitting in front of her and talking about their most deepest darkest secrets so what can you do it's the continuity it says i stand by the ones that i know and that i love i'm looking forward to the future we get back to loving one another this hate s has to stop hopefully it goes out of style soon this post is not meant to disregard the feelings of others and their experiences it's simply to show what my experience has been with my friend love you for life ellen which i definitely agree with right and this is what you would have wanted again it's not the same with the crystalia thing i know it's underage girls involved but reading the story this is what you would have wanted from brian can and brenda Shaw, right to do to do to their friend hey i'm gonna stand by my friend because i know him to be a good guy so that in case the guillot the cancellation guillotine comes for you, you have somebody else that can kind of rally around you. But when they all kind of scurry back into their little caves and start pointing fingers and start pretending like they don't know anybody, eventually those same people that cancel everybody, they smell blood and they eventually come after you. Hence with the Brian Callen situation and hence maybe other allegations that might come out later in the future, allegedly if you believe what you read on the internet. But again, I think it's commendable. I think it's maybe ill timed. Because, again, the allegations aren't from other celebrities. Mainly, they're from people that actually work on the show. But, again, you know, look, it is what it is. Um, Ellen might be a bit of a pain to work for. But I don't think it's any secret. And I just think working in the entertainment industry and that level, you have to expect that some people that you work with are going to be complete, absolute assholes. Um, they're going to, you know um rule with an iron fist they're going to make the, the working environment that you're working very very unpleasant but they should serve as an example of what not to do when you get to your position i think in my opinion but again what do i know next on the list oh we have this interesting one so ufc 256 happened the other day or 252 sorry 256 my show 255 um and uh cheeto vera um beat shane, sugar shane o'malley which i'm disappointed by because i'm a big fan of, of shane um the i guess if you're a sugar shane fan you would be very confident going into the fight because he's very confident going into the fight he kind of gave us the rundown and essentially was basically saying that his speed and his power would be too much for uh cheeto and in the first opening rounds of the fight or the first few minutes it kind of got that feeling there was a bit more snap and a bit more push to what uh sugar shane was throwing but then when you hear the interview with uh, cheeto very afterwards you forget the fact that he was actually purposefully giving up that first round just trying to feel him out and trying to see where he was at so that he can kind of turn up the turn up the pressure in the latter rounds which is um, something that a lot of the top pros sometimes do especially if you know you can weather the storm and you've got you know enough of a dogged determination to kind of go for a bit of pain but um the good thing i like about the fight is that it ended in a weird way because sugar shane got injured right but he got injured basically due to if you believe the story that he uh, damaged his foot or his ankle in training um didn't disclose it went into the fight he didn't want to have any excuses i guess because the last fight that they had scheduled was uh cancelled due to uh shane testing positive i'm not sure if it was a supplement or if it was weed whatever it may be and it, and the show got i'm um, sorry the, the fight got cancelled he got suspended for a predetermined set of time and they moved on so i guess in his eyes he didn't want to cancel it twice and be looked at as a bad guy and you know have his name disparaged when he say way shape or form have people say that he was ducking a fight so he basically dogged through it grit his teeth in terms of fight hoping he could get a quick finish and no one would know of his injury but of course when you step up in the ufc and you make that jump to the people you know that are probably occupying the top 10 top five positions there is no easy fights at all regardless of who you fight regardless of how talented you are but i also like the fact that the injury was exasperated or was inflamed due to cheeto checking the kicks which i love in ufc i love that sometimes fights don't get decided just by somebody knocking somebody out or choking somebody out sometimes they get decided by you maybe exasperating somebody's pre-condition pre-existing injury or by you basically putting the pressure on somebody maybe you know backing up backing them up and backing them up to the cage consistently throughout each round um 
uh, throwing really heavy, heavy shots, right? That kind of makes somebody worry that if they do try and kick you, they're going to be op left open to an overhand right. These little things that kind of wear in your mind. And I guess the checking of kicks is a big one because people in the UFC, it seems like there's a big split with fighters around checking kicks. Um, because it hurts, right? I did I did a bit of mixed martial arts for like six weeks uh, via like a Groupon uh, voucher that I had ages ago. Uh, it was no joke, right? Um, again, it was a bloody wishy-washy class I went to, mostly doing pad work and some sparring, but checking kicks is no joke. Even with pads, it hurts like hell, especially when somebody knows what they're doing and they actually want to inflict pain. Um, so I can only imagine what that must be like doing it bare-legged, um, especially when you know, the other person as well wants to inflict pain and get you on the floor and basically turn your lights out. But sometimes checking kicks can really put off the other fighter because they know that you're willing to check a kick because it hurts you as well. And that checking a kick might have inflamed or agitated the injury that Sugar Shane already had. Um, so much so that he crumbled, uh, he buckled uh, after a punch or uh, no, he got pushed and then he buckled and fell on the floor and couldn't stand back up again. And then uh, Ch Chito Vera basically finished him with a ground and pound and won by TKO. Uh, this is a video of him getting interviewed by Joe Rogan. And I love the fact that he mentioned how he conquered his inner bitch via listening to a Joe Rogan podcast. I thought that was really, really wholesome to listen to. Let's play it here. Referee Herb Dean has called a stop to this contest at four minutes, 40 seconds of the very first round. Declaring the winner by TKO Marlon Chito Vera. He's, he's a very likable I mean, figure as well. I'm one very, of the people that likeable. thought you got robbed in your last fight. So it's very nice to see you come off with a victory tonight and perhaps the biggest victory of your career. So much hype behind Sean O'Malley. Tell us how you're feeling right now. Man, like, as I always say, hype, big name, fame, none of this, none of those things counts when you, if you don't put in hard work, dedication. You're, you're the perfect example. Yeah, exactly. I learned that from you when you talk in your podcast and the things that you say about push yourself and don't be a <laughs> and conquer your inner <laughs> All those <laughs> things, yo, you make you make you make to the big level to the next step. So thank you for that. My what a legend. And again, I think that's... um. It's something that's not really emphasized a lot in UFC, but I wonder what it must be so. It must be such a weird experience going into a fight, knowing that you're fighting somebody who everyone has pinned their hopes on and being the next big superstar in your division or in the organization in general, and they're essentially feeding you. They essentially you felt you feel as if they feed. They're, you feel as if you're being sacrificed for his the sake of his career, but then you also have a family to support. You also have pride. You also have um uh ambitions right that you want to achieve so to go into a fight knowing all those stacks or all those cards are stacked against you then you look on the betting websites and stuff and you see that you're a severe underdog everyone has their money on sugar shane knocking you out not even winning right so just dis disrespectful completely because they think that you're just a complete can i wonder what that must be like for a fighter to go into a fight like that and then for you to win under these circumstances must be super gratifying. Regardless if you think, oh, he wouldn't have won if Sugar Shane was fit and his ankle wasn't hurt. It doesn't matter. I still think there is a skill involved in actually making somebody... Because again, if, if, he, if he doesn't check the kicks, maybe Sugar Shane's ankle doesn't give way. Who knows? We don't know. I have no idea if that's true or not. But him checking the kicks, him actually standing there, taking some of Sugar Shane's big shots in the beginning of the fight, basically gave him a platform to be like, hey, I can take your hardest shots. Can you take mine? Do you know what I mean? And that is what the UFC is about at the highest level. Yeah, you're good. I'm good too. We're all good. It's about who's got, and I think he mentions it later on in the interview. He says like, he has a bigger dog in him. Like he has the ability to kind of grit his teeth and really get stuck in there. And again, maybe this is an opportunity for Shane to go back to the drawing board as well, like similar to Masvidal and be like, you know what? I've got all the talent in the world, but that he's missing that little extra bit, that bit that would mean that you'd actually, you know, rather die in the octagon than lose under any certain, uh, under a circumstance that you are not accepting in that situation. So again, big up uh, Chito Vera. Um, incredible win, really one for the books that one, and again, inspirational that he able to kind of turn that around in that way and shape and fashion. Next on the list here, we have an in interesting article, an interesting, no, interesting uh, tweet thread that someone posted about Jordan Peterson and his daughter, Michaela Peterson, and I guess he's uh, continuing battles with his health. Um, Jordan Peterson's gone through it, man. Again, it's hard, it's hard to watch it from the outside. I've got his books, Oh, I've got his book, 12 Rules for Life. I went to go see him talk at the Emmanuel Center in 2017. It's part of the 12 Steps for Life 
or 12 Rules for Life um, press tour that he did was really amazing to see him speak in person. Um, one of our most prominent public intellectuals, I think, worldwide. Somebody a lot of people kind of credit with turning their complete life around. Somebody that kind of preaches personal responsibility. Um, loads of really good messages and uh, points of view in the stuff that he speaks of. And again, it just serves as a good platform. I think, you know, maybe getting a little bit obsessed and cultish around him is a bit weird. But I think these people, such as the Joe Rogans and the Jordan, Peters Jordan Petersons, are meant to kind of point you in the right direction and then for you to kind of take ownership and sort of like decide where you want to go after the fact right but they're meant to provide you with a good example right if if there is such a thing as bad influences there is such a good thing as there is such as there's such a thing as good influences that provide you with a bit of a guide of where to go and jordan peterson was one of those for me at that time so it's hard to see him going through these battles he's going through at the moment i guess he's uh, the first thing to happen was uh michaela peterson had loads of health difficulties in the beginning especially when she was much younger she had loads of joint issues and all that sort of stuff so that really put a strain in the family they kind of got that under control in some way shape or form then his wife went through a bout of cancer um went through chemotherapy that's not a really good place to be in for a family and i guess jordan peterson being super codependent on his wife and them being a really strong family unit he took it really badly and already i think he already suffers from some mild form of depression already he tried to take some medication to help the situation and just completely spiraled to the point where um, he had to resort to implementing a carnivore only diet elimination diet of sorts to try and get his body back in balance that then maybe led to his other problems that he had with um, opioids and all that sort of stuff and he went to weird places in eastern europe to get treatment and then he got sick again and he had to go into a mental institution just he's had a complete re really he's had a really really shit show of a time in general um it's good to see him back on the men now at the moment but it's just, I guess a lot of people are like pointing a finger at Michaela Peterson that she is the, you know, what what does he say? He says, um, she's the she is the feminine feminine representation of chaos in his own life, right? And he doesn't even know it. But again, it's your family. What can you do, innit? And I don't really think it's fair even to say that. But again, we don't know what they're doing day to day. I don't think it's fair for us to kind of pry in that way. But I'm just happy that he's alive and well and kind of on the mend in some way shape or form but i thought this thread was interesting kind of details a little bit of what i spoke about this is from a guy called rational disconnect says uh effort a thread about jordan peterson's family saga i guess this cover's not real i'm not sure if it is real but it's a jordan peterson mikhail peterson our carnivore diet how to cure depression disease with me only which is mad to say but this is what it starts with it says um michaela started the lion diet which consists of only eating beef salt and water although this verges on an eating disorder. Michaela claimed that it killed many of her health problems. She even announced that she stopped taking her medication, including anti herbs, anti herpes drug. Bloody hell! I guess there is maybe some truth to it if you do el eliminate everything from your diet and just focus on protein. I guess in the short term it can help, similar to you know short bouts of veganism, vegetarianism, regard any kind of diet where you're limiting certain things to kind of get your body back in balance can help but there has to come a time where you kind of try to um if not supplement some of the things you're missing out on with supplements but you try to get back to some level of normality especially when you've reached the base level of health and fitness and try and maybe reduce things bit by bit into your diet just so you can get to a good base it has to be i don't think you can continue this sort of stuff you know daily and this is a quote here i guess a page from one of the books that says um okay this is someone else's point this is continuing with a thread it says here she then convinced her father uh to start her diet soon after starting Judy peterson stopped reported that he stopped taking her and his antidepressants antidepressants he's mckenna peterson she's always posting pictures of her in bikinis and stuff i guess enjoy yourself um it says around this time peterson reported that not being able to sleep for 25 days straight while experiencing an overwhelming sense of impending doom after drinking some apple cider god almighty jordan peterson negative story okay okay one of the things that both Michaela and I noticed was that when we restricted our diet and then What's happening here? ate something we weren't supposed to the reaction to eating what we weren't supposed to was absolutely catastrophic okay. what did you so, do what did you switch to or what did you eat rather um 
Well, the worst response, I think we're allergic to, or allergic, whatever the hell this is, having an, uh, an inflammatory response to something called sulfites. And we had some apple cider that had sulfites in it, and that was really not good. Like, I was done for a month. That was the first time I talked to Sam Harris. You were done for a month? Oh, yeah. It took me out for a month. It was awful. Really? Yeah, yeah. So I would say, so look. What, and what, so this is right before. This isn't really a good uh, advertisement for the meat-only diet, is it? And again, maybe there is some benefits for it. I think... Some people are probably a bit more predisposed to the benefits of a meat diet than other people. But again, if you have to go through this to get glowing skin and lose some weight to fit in some jeans, it probably isn't that worth it, is it? It continues here. It says, it was because of this anxiety caused by a severe autoimmune reaction to food that Jordan Peterson was prescribed uh, benzodiazepine, which was increased after his wife was diagnosed with cancer. This led to Peterson developing a physical dependency on the medication. God almighty. This is a Peterson's problems, uh, quote here, Peterson's health problems first surfaced in 2019 when his family announced that he had undergone a stint in rehab in upstate New York. According to Michaela's update from Russia, he was prescribed a sedative, uh, clonzepam and benzodiazepine by his family doctor in 2017 for anxiety stemming from a severe autoimmune reaction to food. Peterson's doctor allegedly increased his dose after Peterson's wife was diagnosed with kidney cancer in April 2 of 2019. Peterson supposedly didn't realize he'd become dependent on clonzepine until he suffered agonizing withdrawal symptoms when he tried to quit medication cold turkey during the summer of 2019 god almighty it continues here it says according to michaela after multiple failed rehab attempts which she has claims almost killed him peterson was moved to russia for alternative treatments the unknown treatments um put peterson into a medically induced coma for eight days and gave him neurological damage god almighty again i don't know whose idea it was to go there and do this sort of stuff but this is wild again i'm just happy he's alive dude i really am this other family drama stuff i just have no issue with whatsoever but it's just funny to it's just funny to see how somebody that has their life in some sort of order and kind of preaching or kind of espousing you know the need to uh take some kind of responsibility and reins on your family has got a family member that his by all intents and purposes, maybe caused an entire whirlwind of issues to come to their doorstep. And it comes continues here. I guess it's the most Im inflammatory bit. It says, in the middle of her father's hospitalization, Michaela left her husband and dad to travel around Romania with Andrew Tate, a misogynist pickup artist and webcam pimp who runs a scam website and thinks that depression doesn't exist. Oh, Jesus Christ, Michaela Pearson, man. You can't, you can't, I don't know. God, God almighty. Um, continues to side note, Michaela's husband is from Russia, claims to be possessed by the demon named Igor, and is the one who helped Michaela and her dad into Russia. It says, it says it continued here, and Michaela was charging people fifty to six hundred dollars for membership for a diet website that offered virtually nothing. The site is now defunct for a second time, and was basically just a support group of people claiming that the diet killed them. But does it work for anyone? Um, so say, well apparently it didn't work for her father as we have already seen it didn't work for her because she admitted that she also took anti-anxiety drugs while on a diet and it didn't help her mother who was on a diet and was diagnosed with kidney cancer requiring two surgeries anyone that thinks it's, I don't know anyone that thinks a diet is going to cure you of cancer anyway is probably a bit of a wild person I don't think that's the fact I think they were probably looking for other ways to help the situation um, alongside of doing stuff like chemo but it doesn't look good as it the optics it says after Peterson finished his treatment in Russia, they went to Florida, eventually ended up in Serbia, where Michaela gave her entire family COVID-19 <laughs> COVID, <laughs> in Jordan yet again. Oh, absolute legend. It says the other crazy thing is that as far as I can tell, Jordan hasn't talked directly to the media since 2019. All updates have come through his daughter. But yeah, man, I'm just happy he's alive, man. I really am. I really could give a toss about the family. Um, I think everyone has to deal with their own situation. It's hard for people to judge like that. I don't think it's fair. But yeah, he's going through it. I guess we should have just sent him our love and our well wishes and hope he gets better sooner rather than later. We hear from him directly and get a, get a kind of a grip on what's going on. And maybe he has some, because I think he could actually provide some actually good insight into the uh, prescription drug um, epidemic that's going on in the, in the US now at the moment. So hopefully he gets well soon and we see that going forward. Next on the list. Uh, oh yeah, um, this is a sad one, isn't it? or oh, sad one if you care but um it looks like chris D'Elia's career in hollywood is officially done 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 which is interesting because it seems like since the la times article released alleging that chris D'Elia was accosting 
um, underage girls on Instagram who have been trying to creep into their DMs, trying to fly them out and places like that. It feels like that initial allegation that was refuted by Chris Lea's team when they uh, released the entire emails or gave more context to the emails that were released or the DMs that were sent. Um, it kind of felt as if what actually had happened was that like Chris Lea was just a horny fuck uh, was trying to smash all these fans which he probably shouldn't be doing anyway right especially if you're at that level of i don't know the power thing isn't really a good place but i guess if you're that uh, maybe maybe it's just an adult thing right if you're a celebrity at that age and you have fans that are quite young and impressionable you should be taking it upon yourself to be the adult in the situation and if they are trying to come onto you and they're of age you should be trying to deal with it in the most adult way possible right um and i guess he didn't do that i guess running around town running around the country uh trying to hook up with randoms um at the different places he's stopping at probably eventually caught up with him but i think the accusation that he was purposely trying to go after girls that are underage has basically been proved false he's not a nonce yeah he's not a kiddie fiddler um he's just somebody that's aggressively horny and tries to sleep with every fan that likes his pictures you know some people do that it is what it is i guess we so it's a conversation for another day about how men should maybe uh, act with their fans of teenage horny attractive women coming or girls coming into their dms it's a whole different thing whole different ball game to deal with i'm, I'm imagining um to get used to especially for comedians who aren't necessarily usually um looked at as the heart purpose of the entertainment industry so i guess it's a whole different ball game to deal with and address in the situation how to kind of handle it but what we do know is that he handled it very poorly he didn't do a good job at it but you can't say this guy is a pedophile because he just isn't but i guess in hollywood it's enough to essentially ruin his name and make him radioactive so that no um no student wants to work with him or put their name attached to him in any way shape or form and his own friends in comedy who were you know talking a big game about being independent and not being beholden to the hollywood industry and doing their own thing and podcasting is a whole new different realm they buckled under pressure they all kind of distanced themselves from him didn't really back him up apart from sam Tripoli, i think for the most part everyone kind of threw him under the bus uh brian Callum, and brendan shaw being the you know the main two culprits crying on their show sobbing in tears um as if they'd never heard of chris being a woman as if they'd never heard of him maybe bringing a couple of girls around the comedy store who maybe or maybe who were or maybe weren't underage or appeared to look like they were really young as if it caught them all by surprise right um completely crying sobbing as if they never knew the guy and it was all news to them um sam trippy was anyone that kind of defended them but i guess this news isn't to be su that surprising considering what's going on in the entertainment in, in cinema world i think we're movie industry I guess with most movies being affected by COVID-19, they can't do full premieres and full releases with packed cinemas, you know, limited capacity seating is basically affecting their bottom dollar. A lot of these stu film studios are not going to want to take any chances. If you've got any kind of mud or, you know, stains on your name, they're going to want to reshoot your scenes just so they, they can have any ability to make some kind of return on their investment. And this is one of the cases, Tig Notaro is replacing Chris Lea. It's funny, isn't it? Because Tig Notaro is a bloody woman, right? She's replacing Chris Lea. I don't know what says about Tig Notaro I'm not sure how she will take it um I guess any job is is a, is a job in this kind of climate we're in at the moment if she gets a check from it she's going to be happy but it must it must be a bit of a kick in the stomach to be replaced to to be the replacement of somebody under these circumstances and maybe as well because most likely than not what happened was that she probably auditioned for that role and didn't get it and Chris did so they probably just went back to her and said hey would you want to do it so that double dipping thing is a bit of an issue but in general it's an indication that most probably chris alia's hollywood career is probably over and he probably should be spending his time trying to do the louis ck route and just talk directly to his fans if he thinks he's ever going to become because i guess it's a it's a heart wrenching story if you're a fan of chris alia because you know in the last few months in the last few months prior to him filming this show he didn't mention about his aspirations of wanting to be an action movie star and go into hollywood that was one of his main goals in, in general wasn't it? and he was kind of taking acting very seriously and doing all these classes and stuff so this is going to definitely hurt him but this is definitely the nail in the coffin in terms of his hollywood career going forward it's just from the hollywood report it's a technical title to replace chris alia and zack snyder's army of the dead uh, it says the movie shot last year but a round of reshoots with Port Natara in the heart of the action. Zack Snyder's zombie movie, Army of the Dead, may be done shooting, but it doesn't mean a new actor can't be added to the roll call. Tig Notara, the actress and stand-up comic who recently appeared in Star Trek Discovery, has joined Netflix movie and will replace Crystal Leah, the comedian who has been accused of sexually harassing under his girls. Actually, she's really good in Star Trek Discovery too, by the way. Um, I really recommend you watch that. It doesn't get a lot of uh, good reviews online because I guess it's it's got a lot of... Um, 
work social justice politics involved in it but i guess if you just look at it just from purely as a star trek tv series it's pretty decent i recommend you check it out, especially the first couple of seasons it continues here it says the movie which was all uh, which ha- which has an all-star um international cast led by david uh, dave ba- ba- baptista is that baptista is that the wrestler right i'm assuming right uh rap principal photography late last year and had been in post-production when the pandemic hit America's shores, prompting a lockdown in Hollywood. Snyder, who co-wrote and directed the movie, worked uh, with post houses to keep the process going. The movie will now undergo a quick round of reshoots to incorporate Natara's role. Due to the actors being already dispersed post-filming and due to the pandemic restrictions, the incorporation will be a combination of techniques from actually reshooting scenes and opposite an actual partner to using green screen and CGI technology to blend her in. Jesus Christ. They basically in raising him for the movie after an allegation on social media. That's insane, insane. Um, Dead uh takes place after a zombie outbreak in Las Vegas, centering on a group of mercenaries who take the ultimate gamble, venturing into the quarantine zone to pull off the greatest heist ever attempted. It does sound like an absolute terrible movie, though, to be honest. Um, Ella Purnell, uh, all these names, uh, the, the, and also in the cast, Snyder producing the movie along with Deborah Snyder and Wesley Collar. Social misconduct allegation service against the Lear in June. Allegation the comedy has denied. In the aftermath, he was dropped by his agency, and plans for his unscripted show were scrapped by Netflix. The tire a cancer survivor who's known for her mining her own life in a con- of virtual material wrote produced and, and starred in a critically acclaimed same autobiography amazon series called one mississippi which she co-created with diablo diablo cody her sophomore comedy album released live was the number one selling comedy album in 2012 nominated to a grammy award the multi-hyphenate has also released stand-up specials including happy to be here on netflix and boyish girl interrupted on hbo which was nominated for a grammy and award-winning emmy as an actress she recently appeared in noah hawley's 2019 um natalie portman drama lucy in the sky and paramount film the tire is written by icm partners but yeah man he's been completely raised isn't it? he's been whitewashed he's been not whitewashed but he's been erased from hollywood uh, big blow again I, I don't know man i think it's unfair personally for me I, I do think there is an element of you know there is an element of uh trial by social media in that regard i think the allegations that were put out were wishy-washy at best um i think again like i said he can be accused of being a creep he can be accused of being a little bit too um sexually aggressive with his fans just because someone likes your pick doesn't mean you need to slide in their dms and trying to cost them to try and come to your green room but if they do and they're adults and they're willing to that is whatever it's the a situation between two consenting adults um i guess the situation where he kind of double backed onto a girl that he asked her age and she was underage and she came back a year later and she was overage that was a weird one but in general man i think describing him as a child rapist or as a groomer or something was super extreme um but again this is hollywood this industry that we do at the moment cancer culture is what it is um if anything the benefit he has is that we live in an age where if he sets up a patron and he p- puts out a podcast behind a paywall and he has his own fans contribute and he keeps running his merch and puts on his own shows he'll be fine um if anything this is probably a good thing for him because it's probably revealed who his actual real friends are it's actually revealed who his actual re- actual fans are as well because the people that dropped him probably would never have been his fan i never his fans in the first place anyway but i don't know man it's just it's just um it's annoying that hollywood would do this at this moment especially when he hasn't had a chance to really fight his case in that regard but again i do understand with the pandemic going on at the moment they just can't take any chances they can't allow this film to go out as is with Chris D'Elia in it, have entire articles. Because again, you know what's going to happen. If, he, if he's in the movie, there's going to be a whole slew of articles coming out, uh, bes- besmirching the studio for putting him in the movie. Zack Snyder's going to get it in the neck. It's going to be all unnecessary trouble that no one wants. You know, the whole press interviews and stuff around the film will be centered around Chris D'Elia and these allegations. No one wants that smoke on their name at all. So I definitely get it. But I guess for Chris D'Elia, that's a confirmation that his Hollywood career is donezo. What's on here? Oh yeah, this is an interesting one. Luis J. Gomez v. Uh, Brendan Shaw. So, I'm sure you guys are aware that there's a bit of a rift between the LA guys and L- the the East Coast and West Coast comedians. From what I can see, for the most part, it's mostly. <coughs> it seems like sorry. It seems like a a battle between like the artist and the business people in the industry. 
I guess because I guess for some reason or the other in stand-up comedy or most art forms, I guess it's similar like this, right? Sometimes it reaches a point where it kind of breaks through critical mass and kind of captures the public imagination. And then it kind of becomes a business instead of it just being an art form where you go on stage and just shit house with your friends in the audience and kind of get a laugh of some audience members here and there. But now it's an entire yeah. industry. People are, you know, building out studios, uh, you know, creating shows, writing on shows, doing tours, selling hundreds of thousands worth of, worth of merch, doing amazing live shows of the actual podcast it's his own little infrastructure right that's kind of reserved on the west coast for the most part and then the east coast guys are very much about the art of stand-up and what it means to just go and do a million spots a night um all their podcasts are about jokes there's less cerebral talk about you know crushing it and waking up at 5 a.m and running loads of miles you know for the most like i don't know if you've seen it for the most part i would say most la comics are pretty decent shape health wise and then the east coast guys are a lot more you know they're a lot more um varied in their physical makeup so it does make sense that there will be a bit of a rift between the people that think they're in it for the art and the ones that think they're in it they're only in it for the money and you know rocking up to the comedy store driving an amazing porsche so one of those battles is between chris D'Elia, no one of the battles sorry between luz J. gomez and brendan Shaw. they've kind of had a bit of an on and off sort of tiff ever since i can remember they've always kind of been throwing jazz at each other mostly luz J. gomez to brendan and brian cannon to be honest and i guess mostly because they don't really think brendan's that funny of a stand-up right they think that he kind of got you know um he kind of got uh sped through his process in terms of being a stand-up comedian which we can all agree on i think if you're friends with joe rogan and you can maybe i don't think the joe rogan thing is fair let's say that the most reason why he's been able to kind of jump a few steps is because of his podcast t5k the fire and kids really popular successful podcast he's built it over you know a whole number of years of being consistent and putting out great shows especially in the beginning great funny shows um with some great guests some memorable clips and moments and he's been able to kind of use that as a platform to speak to his audience and then of course take that on and then do stand up in front of that same audience you get a captive fan base that always wants to see you wherever you go around or wherever you go around the country so it's a kind of opposite of what everyone else does where they go and they do the open mics they go around to places that people don't want to see them and then try and build a fan base up that way but nowadays with social media and the internet and with podcasts and youtube you can essentially build an audience via the medium i'm speaking to now and then hopefully wherever you have to sell them whether it's a hoodie whether it's tickets to a show they'll obviously back you up but doesn't necessarily mean because you sell out of a hoodie that you're somehow ralph Lauren. in the same way if you sell out a show doesn't mean you're david hell but i guess if you're a comedian on the east coast it's just hard pill to swallow to see somebody like brendan shaw who you think is not as skilled as you driving around in a porsche and you know buying expensive trainers every day it can kind of grate you up it kind of it kind of wind you up a bit but um i guess they've been going at each other back and forth for a while and i think the the first kind of instance of it which i've kind of gathered here some evidence from the the, the, the from the Le, legion of skanks subreddit that kind of details a little bit of why lucia gomez might have a bit of a issue with brendan Shaw. i think he mentions it in another video i'm going to mention but this is a recent shot that brendan took at Luz j which i thought was pretty pretty brave of him um considering how thin-skinned he is when it comes to comedians kind of the, kind of the cam yeah let me play it here and get it for you and then we can kind of continue so this is the from the fire and the kid i don't know what episode this was i guess it's recently and i guess um this is a uh, brendan's way of taking a shot where he kind of pretends like he doesn't know who somebody is and i get another comic I, and I, they I, both I, really I've only, me. I've only been around lewis like once or twice i don't know him yeah but i know he, jason very nice lewis was very nice to me and i that's the only time i nice. got to know him was that <laughs> <day. laughs> <laughs> he hates him so bad. Oh, it's I saw Lewis fights when he fought. Um, he fought. Come on, Brendan. He does this. Uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah watched the slap fight, and, and Jeremiah beat him. Right. He lit him up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Jeremiah lit him up. But but but. So that was the first shot, right? And he thought, okay, cool, something's going on there. And again, it's a bit. I'm a bit worried for Brendan because he's not the best when it comes to this ribbing. I remember him telling a story of being in a comedy store and. Maybe it was Anthony Jesselnik or somebody ribbing him and he kind of got, oh, I thought, I didn't think he liked me. And then Joe Rogan had to kind of calm him down and say, no, look, this is what comedians do. So for him not to know that anyway, that comedians kind of rib each other in this way was a bit concerning. But again, it's, it's a different world, the LA comedy scene. I'm guessing it's a lot more buddy, buddy, pally, pally. Um, it's a lot more Hollywoodish in that regard. It's not as probably, um, as probably, yeah, it's probably not as, 
annoying as it would be being in New York, right? Having people constantly rib you, and having to constantly be on your A game, be on your toes, and know how to sh- fight back or, you know, throw a Hail Mary here and there. So for Brendan to kind of get involved in this tip for tat isn't the best way to go about things. I think you're allowed to just... I think in general, I'm, I'm going to say, I think you're allowed to be jealous of Brendan if you want. If you're an LA, if you're an East Coast comic, it's fine. You just need to be able to kind of parlay that or use that energy to kind of, you know push your career in a certain direction <clears throat> but you're well within your rights to look at brendan and think how the fuck does he become so successful when he's not as good as i am at the thing that we're both doing but that's obviously not a fair comparison because he's obviously got a very popular podcast and if you're able to build a really big audience and you're able to sell them the things that you do it doesn't necessarily mean you're better it just means you're able to sell to your particular audience i think every show i've basically seen the brendan show where he's been on tour in the united states for the most part we look at a the crowd they look like a very it's very much a t5k crowd right loads of dudes was it 20 was it was the usa 19 to 35 is demographic whatever right um you know kind of chatty bro looking kind of guys who are into because i would never imagine somebody that laughs at a brendan Shaw joke would ever be into a luce gomez type of comedy show anyway or legion of the scans guys they're not they don't even share the same audiences so for them to get annoyed by his success doesn't make any sense but i also do understand it in some regards right because you know it is what it is and you can only compare yourself to the people that are around you and then i guess the second shot was this one this is from the fight on the kids subreddit as well. So big up the homeless cats for clipping this one. This is Brendan Strub talking another jab at him. <coughs> Sorry about this. My few managers are playing up. I should take my ass off my pump. But hey, I'm going to hang in on there. This is Brendan's second shot at Lewis J. And then I'll just play you a video of him basically outlining exactly what his issue is with Brendan Strub to begin with. Come on, load up quickly. <coughs> there we go. Play? Come on, play. There you go. There you go. Uh, because Lewis J. Gomez wants to fight me, but in an MMA fight, and I'm like, I, I heard. Are you sure, dude? I heard. I, I I don't know. I met him once. He was very nice to me. I don't know him at all. I saw his fight against Jeremiah Watkins, who I thought Jeremiah won that. And I'm like, you want to fight wait, Jason? Wait, no. He fought. Did you see him fight at Ellis Mania? He had an MMA fight no. against another podcaster, a Dutch or something. Like he had a he had how, a how, how nickname. Did he go? Did he he beat him. He beat him. It, like you know, he uh, he took him down and el- you know elbows and stuff. He has submissions and he has a little bit of boxing. I Does don't he know have a much... jiu-jitsu background? No, no, he's a comedian. He's a nothing background. He has no. He's just started training maybe a couple of years ago. Because so you I'm, have a big fit. Yeah, I mean, my fan base is as big as his, and I'm like, if we both bigger, show up, yeah. but his thing is, <laughs> see, I don't know what he's doing, man. I don't know what Brendan's doing. This, this is good. not a good matchup, man. Lucia Jacobs has nothing to lose. Brian has. Brendan has all the things to lose, and I guess um, he detailed a little bit of it. Here, Lucia Gomez basically explained his entire issue with Brendan, which I thought was a fairly fair point he made regarding the whole entire issue. I'll quickly play this clip for you now. Oh, let's pause this. This is not the right point about it. Let me get up on here. Was it 1943? Come on, load. Okay, let's go back here. Lucia Gomez details his actual problems with Brendan Shaw on his recent rap show. Uh, with Shane Smith, let's go back over here. It's over here and it's around there. This mark 1943. Let's go back a little bit more. <clears throat> okay, cool. There we go. Boom. Initially, this is why we started taking shots at him. Um, was because he made this comment initially. Initially, year, when I did the uh, LS Mania fight <laughs> against Ryan O'Neill. They, Josh Wolf, who was the guy who was on the show, brought up the Ellis Mania fight, and then he asked Callan if he would ever do it, and then Schaub <laughs> said, oh, I'd be embarrassed if Callan did something like that. Yeah, yeah. For me, I took that as like, oh, shit, he's popping off, which is, it's, and it was, in, I wasn't genuinely offended. It was just sort of the reason that we could start making little jokes and comments, right? So me and Bisping, we use it as a sound drop, I'd be embarrassed, blah, blah, blah. It's silly. It's not really um, anything, but that's what it came from, and then I responded with, I was like, well, it's like a, a fighter doing a Showtime special, you know, before he's ready. <laughs> so I said, uh, which, look, the problem is he opens himself up for the criti- that criticism, right? So, yeah. uh, and here, here's the truth. I don't, I'm not even hating on Shaw. I respect the fact that this guy retired from fighting. He is doing something. He's making a career for himself. I don't give a fuck, dude. If you can figure out a path to make some cash and succeed and, and, sort of weave your way through life and you know do it how do you yeah. not respect it whether i don't give a shit if you think the guy's funny or not you like his podcast or not you think he's an idiot you have to respect the fact that 
he was able to navigate to where he's at. There's something sort of crazy there. Whether, you know, people are given opportunities, they're not given opportunities. Um, you still have to fuck. There are plenty of people that were friends with Joe Rogan that are not famous and are not rich right now. Let's get that's a really good point. And I guess that's and I guess that's a really interesting part of Brendan Schulz's career uh trajectory over the years. He's kind of turned people off mostly based on how he goes about conducting himself on his own podcast. If you speak, if you listen to any of these podcasts um, and they kind of allude to his success, <clears throat> most people always say he's a nice person to meet in person. Everyone says he's real salt of the earth kind of guy, really cool, really helpful, friendly. No one's got a bad word to say about him in person because I'm for sure com comedians are bitchy, gossipy sons of bitches, isn't it, right? If he was a bad guy behind the scenes, someone would say something. So for the most part, people like him in the industry, in the scene. His fellow peers, his comedians, they, they like him as a person. But he has made, he has turned so many people off online, fans and former fans, by the stuff he's said on his podcast, especially during COVID. It's just been, you know, pretty hard to listen to him rabbit on about numbers and all this sort of stuff. And he got COVID and refused to back down and double down his position, just being a complete doof about it. But all the way throughout the years, even throughout his MMA commentary and all this sort of stuff, that's the thing that's really turned people off, not his actual success. His success has just been like one of those other things people pointed to, like, oh, and also you don't deserve this and that and that and the other. But really the thing that people, people are annoyed about him of is because he just comes across really badly on his podcast. Which is the odd thing about it is that he has no um, reflect, self-reflection, I guess, in that regard. He'll be able to address it because it's pretty easy to address because it seems like he still has a, a big fan base, right? People are supporting the stuff he does. A lot of fans back the Patreon for the fight in the rinks. Um, it seems like, you know, um, his supporters buy all his merch, they buy tickets to his shows. So people like what he does. If only he could just somehow be able to become less unlikable on the podcast it'd be a lot better for him going forward and i guess he wouldn't have this kind of animosity with some people in the industry in terms of the comedians and stuff because it would because <laughs> i think a lot of the comedians just read the post online that kind of despise brendan too to kind of feed into their negativity about the guy but for the most part most of the people that meet him pretty much like him in general they think they think he's a pretty decent guy and no one really thinks that he's his success is if in any way taken away from their success because again you can't you can't honestly look at yourself if you're a legion of the scans guy and think that brendan schaub's audience would ever come to your show they're never going to do that right so you don't ever just share an audience it is what it is isn't it his success isn't your success but i just do think that he just runs up people so much especially just with what he says on his own podcast that it just makes it really difficult to even back him in any way shape or form even if you're other comedian so it is to see what happens with that one. I'm guessing if you're Brendan Shaw, we're definitely looking forward to um, Jason Ellis absolutely manhandling uh, Luis James Gomez so he can go back on the show and pretend that you don't know him. He didn't watch the show, but you saw him get beaten up. But I don't know, man. I, I, I think it's, it's sad to see, really. I, I do think there is a way that they could both coexist, um, the artists and the business people. I don't think the LA comedy scene is the be all and end all of everything. I think even at the time when they were all going on, this is the murderer's role, the best place. Come on, relax. There's good stand ups everywhere, especially in North America. There's people killing it in their own little city uh, with their residency at a local club that don't travel much because they have families or because they've worked out a way where they can just be support support themselves via Patreon and just do your show every other month here and there in a local town where people know they act and they like what they do, right? It doesn't mean just because you're in a comedy store that you happen to be the pinnacle or the top of the mountain of comedians. That was always a bit of a fallacy anyway. Because if that's true, then Brendan Shaw would have, should have never been, you know, he should never be on the marquee. But again, because it's a business, they have to sell tickets, uh, bums and seats. If you put Brendan's name on there, he's part of the fire and the kid. Uh, people are going to come in, they're going to buy drinks, they're going to buy tickets. I get it, it makes sense, but let's not conflate the two things. But, you know, let's be able to have them both live in the same universe as well. I think, anyway, in my opinion. But let's see what happens. Lucia is going to be, and it's, it's coming up very soon, I think. I'm not sure where. Um, it's probably going to be a pay per view thing, I'm imagining, on Gas Digital. I'd imagine so. I'm not sure how, where they're going to show those things, but you know who Brendan Schulz is going to be rooting for in that one, isn't it? You know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's the Action Zing Show episode number 256. Thanks so much for tuning in. <coughs> As you can see, my allergies are playing up, so I'm going to end the show right there. It's been a pleasure to have you um, listening. As per usual, if you're watching this via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. If you want to support the show, please click the link below on patreon.com forward slash agostino that's a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o subscribe for as little as one dollar a month and you get the whole audio podcast ahead of time before everybody else on that platform so until then see you guys very very soon take care peace bye